Did you know that hundreds of successful people have written their stories in books and told how they did it on cassettes like this and people don't want to listen? How would you explain that? One of the major things Shof taught me when I met him, he said, poor thinking habits keeps most people poor, not poor working habits. Most people work hard, but they don't think hard. And Shof taught me that the mind is like a factory, a mental factory. And whatever you think about all day long pours ingredients into this mental factory. And that's what builds the economic, social, financial fabric of your life. Our lives are mostly affected by the way we think things are. Not the way they are. The way we think they are affects us most. He quoted me a Bible phrase that says, As you think, so you become. When he talked about poor thinking habits, he had me. I used to start the day reading the morning newspaper. I mean, you can believe that or not. I'd get a cup of coffee and read the paper. I'd load up on wars and riots and murders and stabbings and killings and bank robberies and muggings and car wrecks and tragedies. I'd even read the back pages. I seemed to like that stuff for some weird reason. I'd load up on all that, and then I'd start the day. You can imagine the kind of days I used to have. You walk around on your financial knees. Kids got good questions these days. One of them said to me, Mr. Rohn, how do you build the good life? I said, it's simple. It's not Easy, but it's simple. Here's how you build anything. Select the right ingredients, keep out the wrong ingredients, and it starts with thought. Everything starts with thought. So you must be wise and careful what you think about because that starts everything. And you decide what goes into your mental factory. Don't let anybody just dump anything they want to in your mental factory because you've got to live with the result. The guy says, I want to be a great leader. Wonderful. The first thing we do is follow him to his house. When we get there, we walk in and check his library. Number one. Somebody says, well, why check his library? The reason is because what a man reads pours massive ingredients into his mental factory and the fabric of his life is built from those ingredients. You would not believe what some people have got in their house to read. You would not believe. One of the best dressed up words I know for a lot of it is trash. Can you imagine dumping a bale of trash into this mental factory every day and coming out with a rich, dynamic, positive life? It can't be done. Now, you don't have to read or listen to educational cassettes half the night. Although if you're broke, it's a good place to start. But here is all I ask, just 30 minutes a day. That's all. Stretch it to an hour if you can, but at least 30 minutes. Half rich isn't bad. 30 minutes. Hear or read something challenging, something instructional, at least 30 minutes a day. And here's the next key. Every day. Don't miss. Miss a meal, but not your 30 minutes. Hey, you can get along without some meals, but you can't get along without some ideas, examples, and inspiration. How easy is it to get up in the morning when you know you're not doing all that it takes? It's not very easy at all. You can just lay there awake thinking, oh, what's a few more minutes in bed? It won't matter much anyway. Wrong. It does matter. It will matter. Now, how easy is it to get up in the morning when you're pouring it on, doing the best you can, anxious to get going, make progress toward your dreams? It's a whole different story. When you're resting to renew your reserves, it's much different than resting to avoid your day. When you're psyched up and excited for your life, when you're excited for what you've planned to accomplish for the day, it's amazing you'll wake up before the alarm clock even tries to startle you awake. Your successes fuel your ambition. Your successes give you extra energy. Your successes pave the way for more successes. It's the snowball effect. With one success, you're excited to meet another, and another, and another. And pretty soon, the disciplines that were so difficult in the beginning, the disciplines that got you going, are now part of your philosophy. How do you know when you're successful? Do you have to be a millionaire? No. 
All we ask of you is that you earn all you possibly can. If you earn 10000 a year and that's the best you can do, that's enough. God and everything else will see to it that you're okay. The key is to just do the best you can. If it's 10000 a year, wonderful. If it's 100000 a year, wonderful. If it's a million a year, wonderful. It doesn't matter 10,000 a year or a million a year. It doesn't matter as long as you've done the best you possibly can. Earn the most you possibly can. Be the most you possibly can. And here's why. The essence of life is growth. The essence of life is growth to do the best you can. We keep growing until we're done. Get around successful people and listen. Now, you can also learn from unsuccessful people. Take notes on both, negative and positive. On the negative, the notes are called what not to do. And you got to learn what not to do as well as what to do. So learn from the negative as well as the positive. Find out what good people read and don't read it. But now you can also learn from the positive. Get around successful people. Listen to what they say. Listen to how they say it. It's important. We've all got about 16 waking hours. Practice listening those 16 hours. And I say practice listening because listening isn't easy. I found out it's easier to talk than it is to listen. But if you will practice listening the 16 hours you're awake, sure enough from surprising sources comes great ideas. Now here's some of the best advice I've got for the whole evening. It won't get any better than this. This is it. Poor people ought to take rich people out to dinner and listen. That's some of the best I got. If a guy's not doing well, one of the first things he ought to do is find a guy that is doing well and offer to buy him his dinner. Spend 50, 60, 80 hundred dollars. Go for the full nine course. Start him on the juices and hors d'oeuvres. Get him started and talking. The salad takes 15 minutes. Keep it rolling. Biggest steak in town takes 45. Keep it rolling. Pour on the dessert. Strix that meal out about two hours. If you get a successful person to eat and talk for two hours, they're liable to drop ideas in your lap, change your life. Multiply your income by two, by three, by five. But you're right. Poor people don't usually take rich people out to dinner. That's the problem. The guy said he's rich, let him buy his own dinner. I'm not coming up with any money. The words we have are the only words available to us the words we know are the only tools available to us to, number one, interpret what's going on, to interpret what's being said, and to express your heart and your mind. Now, if you can't interpret well, and if you can't express well, you can imagine what a deterrent that is to the good life and the extra treasures, the extra feelings, awareness, riches, power, influence. So it's very important to have a good vocabulary. It's very important now to be able to translate it. Learning to say it well. Now this is a whole subject in itself. This is worth a weekend of study. Let me just give you a short list of suggestions on learning to say it well. Number one, repetition. It just takes practice. I don't know any substitute for the practice. To learn any skill, you've just got to go through it again and again and again. You just do it over and over and often. Next is vocabulary. Saying it well is proper choice of words. To build my early vocabulary, I used to put three or four words I didn't know on a card, put it up on the sun visor, on my car. Back in those days, I traveled a lot by car. Sure enough, by the end of the day, I'd mastered two or three words. Vocabulary. Vocabulary is a way of seeing. One reason for vocabulary is to interpret what we see, to interpret what we hear. The vocabulary of the mind grapples with the words and the images that come to our mind. Now, if you've got a poor set of words and skills and tools with which to interpret, you can imagine the errors and the mistakes you'll make in judgment. And since vocabulary is a way of seeing, if you can't see well, you can imagine the errors you can make and how they compound as life unfolds. We do two things with vocabulary. We interpret and we express. Here's some other parts to saying it well. Sincerity, from the heart, with noble intent, wishing to bring value, 
that adds immeasurably to your ability to speak well, communicate well. There's no substitute for sincerity. I can forgive you for a mistake in judgment, but I can't forgive you for a mistake in intent. Next key part to saying it well, brevity. Part of the key is to be brief. You can't linger too long, I've discovered in my lecturing and speaking around the world. Can't linger too long on any one point. I used to tell stories too long, too long. I'd get involved in a long, long story on and on. By the time I hit the punchline, people forgot how it started. Now it doesn't make sense. Too long. Here's why brevity is important. The human attention span is short. You haven't got long to get it said before you lose your audience. Sometimes we try to make up in words what we lack in self-confidence. So part of the key to being brief is personal development, personal growth, personal awareness, understanding self-worth. Now you can use the economy of words. And this is a good position to be in, that what you are adds so much weight to what you say that you don't have to say very much. But brevity is a good point on saying it well. Here now starts the power of what we say, intensity. Part of the strength of what we say is the words we choose. The greater part of the strength of what we say is the emotions that are loaded into the words. Here's what has power unmatched, words loaded with emotion. There is no greater power. Words have an effect, but words loaded with emotion have an incredible effect. My words may reach you, but if I can't touch you with my spirit, if I can't touch you with my emotions, my feelings, my beliefs, then I probably haven't affected you very much. The feeling, the belief, the commitment, all that I am, if I can put more of what I am into what I say, no telling what miracle I can wrought, no telling how much of an effect I can be. Real persuasion comes from putting you into what you say. But now here's part of the clue, and we call these extra refinement of leadership skills, learning to measure your emotions. That's very important to learn to measure your emotions. You don't need an atomic explosion for a minor point. Enough, but not too much. We call this understanding how to measure the flow of your emotions to cover a point. Okay, but if it needs heavyweight stuff, you reach and get it. If it needs a milder approach, you learn how to measure it in milder, easier terms. But it's very important to measure your emotions, your feelings. Now, what do we mean by intensity and emotions? Here it is. All of your experiences and how they've affected you. That's the sum total of your emotional content. Where you've been and what you've heard and what you've seen and who you've met and this whole panorama of life experiences for you up until now and how you felt about all that. That we call the sum total of your emotion. Now the key is to learn how to measure all that and put it in effective amounts into the words you choose. So here's the key to effective communication. Well-chosen words loaded with well-measured emotion. Next is style. And there's all kinds of parts to style from body language and gestures to facial expressions and eyes and emotion. But style is very important. Here's part of the clue. It's not just the matter you cover, it's the manner in which you cover the matter. Style is important to attract someone's attention, to emphasize the point. Now I've got a couple of good points here on style. Be a student of style, but don't just copy someone's style. Make sure that the study of style becomes distinctly you. But it is also important to be a student of style. How people speak well, be a student of that. And then borrowing bits and pieces from people you admire and the way they can communicate. Then make sure that all of that blended into you becomes your own distinctive style. But style is very important. Now there's a variety of styles. But it's important to study your own style and say, how am I coming across in style? Should I learn to emphasize more? Should I learn to be more emphatic? All these things concerning style. Read your audience. It's very important to read and to pick up the signals of what's happening with your audience. So let me give you some clues on reading. Simply to listen. Part of reading is listening. You pick up a lot of clues as to what else to say, what all to say by being a good listener. 
From early times, I think we've learned to be a good speaker. You've got to be a good listener. That's where you pick up the information, is to listen well, especially in a private conversation, a more informal conversation. Good listening habits. That's part of reading. There's a Bible phrase that says, humans cannot live on bread alone or food alone. It says the next most important thing to bread is words. Words nourish the mind. Words nourish the soul. Humans have to have food and words to be healthy and prosperous. Make sure you have a good diet of words every day. Wanting to excel in all of the skills and settling for nothing less than an outstanding performance. If you're willing to be the best in your field, if you're willing to demand of yourself excellence in skills, to be the best that you can possibly be, in the training, do the best you possibly can. In doing a workshop, do the best you possibly can. Developing the skills of using your personality, developing the skills of language, developing the skills of influence, developing the skills of organizing. If you're willing to be an expert in all of the skills and not only make a handsome living, not only make a lot of money, but if you would so desire and if it would be your purpose, a chance to make your fortune. Expertise, excellence in skills, making a powerful contribution to you, the variable, and that is preparation well prepared. And preparation, of course, involves a whole lot of things. A big share of our life is preparing, getting ready. When we go to the first grade in school, we're just preparing for the second grade. After we've finished two grades, the two grades prepare us for number three. Sometimes it seems like a long, excruciating time. And the time will just seem like it'll never come when we can finally have the performance that we really want. But it takes time to prepare. It takes time to get ready. And the decisions you make in the preparation time, those are the decisions that last for a lifetime. Preparing to have a good day. It's that preparing, maybe the night before, maybe the couple of days before the day that you're going to put everything together. The preparation for a meeting means that you've taken it serious. The preparation for doing a workshop means you're serious about the workshop. You want to make the best contribution. That kind of preparation is important. But here's preparation that's very vital, and that is to prepare yourself for success. Life seemingly does not wish to waste success on the unprepared. Life says, why waste a fortune on this person? They're not prepared to do the right things with it. They're not prepared to use it wisely. If a fortune was bestowed upon this unprepared person, it would probably be wasted. The people that could have been touched won't be touched. What could have been done won't be done because... This fortune will have been wasted on the unprepared person. So not only look for fortune, not only look for the promise, but prepare yourself and ask of yourself, what can I do to make myself ready? Because remember, life was designed not to give us what we want, not to give us what we need, but life was designed to give us what we deserve. Every value in life must be paid for. And those that pay are the ones that get it. It says those that give receive. Someone says, I wish to receive, I wish to receive. You don't have to concentrate on receiving. Just become a good giver. It says those that search will find. Someone says, well, I need to find some good ideas to help change my life for the future. Then to find good ideas, that doesn't come because you need them. It's because it comes because you search for them. If you want good ideas, you've got to go after them. You've got to go to the class. You've got to go to the workshop. You've got to go to the training. Go to the book right? you got to go to the journal, right? Go where good ideas are being taught. Go searching, go looking, because good ideas are not going to be wasted on those that are not seeking, searching, well prepared. So prepare yourself to be ready for fortune when it comes, to be ready for challenge when it comes, to be ready for opportunity when it comes. That's my goal. I'm sure it's your goal. Now here's another one. It's called self-discipline. Self-discipline all of us have a challenge with that because sometimes it's easy, and especially if you're working hard, doing the best you can, it's easy sometimes to let up and let it go. But remember, so many people, especially now that we're as big as we are around the world, are counting on what we do. At home office, they have to be careful. They have to be disciplined. It's easy for the person who ships the product from Herbalife says, oh, well, I'll wait until tomorrow to ship it. And then they go home and sleep like a baby. 
but the distributor who's waiting for that product doesn't sleep that night or doesn't sleep when the product doesn't show on time. But if everybody will have the discipline to say, I will do the best job I can, I will make mistakes, of course, because we're all human, but I'll try to remedy those mistakes and do the best job I can. That kind of self-discipline that understands how important your part is in all of the functions that work. Coming to work on the set here, uh, HBN, there's so many people that play a part. And each one of the parts that are played is necessary to put on the broadcast, make it viable, make it real, make it powerful. Any couple of them missing, and it would be a disaster. But all of it put together, and it works like a charm. Each person developing the self-discipline to do their part, do their job. Here's the next one, self-confidence. Where does self-confidence come from? And this is the best advice I can give you on that. Not neglecting, first of all, the small daily discipline. Self-confidence really comes from feeling good about yourself. And one of the best ways to feel good about yourself is at the end of the day to know that you poured it on. You did your best. If you conducted a meeting, you did the best you could. If you made a phone call, it was the best phone call you could possibly make. If you wrote a letter, it wasn't a casual letter. It was your best letter. At the end of those kind of days, when you feel good about yourself, self-confidence starts to rise. You know that if you can have this kind of a good day, you can have another one the next day, and those days become the weeks, the weeks become the months, and the month becomes a powerful year. Self-confidence comes from the lack of neglect. If you will not neglect to do the small daily disciplines, that's where self-confidence comes from. Part of good health is self-confidence. I know I'm going to be healthy. I eat the apple a day. I walk around the block. I do the jogging on the beach. At the end of the day, when you've really poured it on and you've done all the stuff, self-confidence grows. That self-confidence affects your health. It affects your future. It affects your psyche. Though this is true, one of the great powers is self-confidence. Self-confidence means willingness to do whatever it takes to achieve. Some people say, well, I'll do it for a little while and see what happens. You know, I'll try a couple of things. If that doesn't work, I'm out of here. And all of us know uh, that that kind of person doesn't have much of a future. But if you're willing to do whatever it takes, if I have to learn a couple of things, I will learn those things. If I got to learn five or six things, I'll learn all six. If I have to take an extra class, I'll take an extra class. If I've got to read the books, I'll read the books. If I have to consult with people who know more than I know, I will do the necessary consulting. Whatever it takes, I will do. That starts to develop unbelievable self-confidence. Self-confidence also comes from the ability to rise above your circumstances, to rise above what happens, the petty little thing, the discouraging things that would sink everyone else's ship except yours, that would cause someone else to quit early in the day, but you keep going. That kind of willingness to overcome all circumstances, whether it's the little challenges or the big challenges, if you're willing to do that, I promise you, this kind of power will work for you, and in you, the variable, it'll make a difference. Now here's another one. In my rather short list, the next word is character. Becoming a person of high value, a person of principle, a person of honesty, a person that earns respect, that kind of character. It took character when Mark started to put the marketing system together. How can we have a system that will build in the integrity that people will know that if this happens, then this will happen? And if this goes wrong, here's the way to fix it. Unless you have the principles and the character and the integrity to put together a viable plan for a wide variety of people, then the system is not going to last very long. And I've been around long enough, and I'm sure you have been around long enough to see a lot of systems that got started, but they failed. And the reason is because they were not constructed with integrity. They were not constructed with character. They were not constructed with doing the right thing. They might have been constructed to take advantage. You know, cash it out as quickly as possible and leave. Mark was involved when others took advantage of him all those years ago before Herbalife. 
when someone took advantage and didn't have the character, didn't have the principles, and didn't have the the character to stay, the character to see it through, the character to do the right thing. So this is important to develop the character within yourself that people see you as honest, as fair, willing to do the right thing, willing to be helpful, but always willing to walk the center line, not to pass the line. It is so dynamic. It is so powerful. And it is so possible in fortune making that sometimes people want to speed up the process by cutting the corners, by neglecting to do the right things, you know, to cheat a little here, cheat a little here, you know, cross the line just a little bit because then, you know, it'll grow faster and you can cash in quicker. Not necessary here. Building and developing your own character. Here's the next key power, and that's image. That is your image of yourself, the way you dress, the way you talk, the way you think, your capacity for learning. All of that is an important image that you have of yourself. The image that you have that if it needs to be learned, you could learn it. If there's a book that needs to be mastered, you could master it. If there's a skill that needs to be learned, why couldn't you get busy now and learn that skill? That kind of self-image that I am continually trying my best to be the best I can. Because one of the most important places you have to look is into the future, yes. You've got to look into the past, yes. You've got to look around, yes. But one of the most important places you have to look is in the mirror. You know, how I appear to other people, that's important. But how I appear to myself is the ultimate importance. That kind of image to where you'll develop the self-confidence, you'll develop the self reliance. Now here's the next one. There's great power in self-reliance. Self-reliance means you simply look mostly to yourself. It would be nice if someone just gave you this, gave you this, gave you this. It would be nice if everyone did their job exactly as they're supposed to do it. But here's what you've got to do. Primarily rely on yourself. Primarily say, I'm the person responsible. And I will learn the necessary skills so that I can help people learn their skills. If I need lots of people to do certain things to build my organization, that is what I must have. But I've got to be the final backstop. I've got to be the final one that people can rely on. So that if this is missed and this is missed, I can catch up. I can fill the gap. I can do the job. We have to do it when we conduct meetings. We have to do it when we conduct training. We have to do it when we're in a class of just a few. What someone might have missed, we're there to fill in. Self-reliance. Primarily, we're learning to count on yourself. So that you can do this. Never complain and never explain. And here's what I have wrote about enthusiasm. Enthusiasm that's powerful is mostly enthusiasm that is enthusiasm inside. 90%. 10% outside. We all know what the enthusiasm is like when somebody lets us see their enthusiasm, which is the, like the 90% and only 10% of it is inside. But the enthusiasm that really affects people is not just being loud, but the enthusiasm that runs deep, the enthusiasm that comes from deep inside, created by self-confidence, created by purpose, created by genuine willingness to help other people. That kind of enthusiasm knowing that you're going to get the job done, knowing you're going to affect people, knowing you're going to have testimonials flowing in from all kinds of uh, directions, that kind of enthusiasm. A lot of it is quiet. A lot of it is unheard. And the 10% that's heard, it rings a bell. People call it genuine enthusiasm because they know that what you say in the outward display of your enthusiasm is only a small tip of the iceberg of the enthusiasm you feel inside that really motivates you to do the best job you can. A person who has purpose in their life, they have something to go for, some meaning. One writer described it, for some people it becomes a magnificent obsession. And for you and I, maybe it doesn't need to be that dramatic as a magnificent obsession. 
but it has to be something that does something to us, something that pulls us, especially into the future. You know, there are many influences on us. One is the influence of the past. Some people are always pulled back, back, back by the past. Some people are always pulled aside by the distractions, the distractions. But here's what's powerful. If you have a list of high purpose in your life, it pulls you toward the future. And the more powerful the purpose is, the stronger it pulls. And here's the other great advantage if you have purpose for the future. It pulls you through all kinds of challenges and all kinds of difficulties. If you don't have these strong purposes for the future, it's easy to get swallowed by a bad day. It's easy to be almost annihilated by a poor month. And it's easy sometimes to almost disappear beneath the waves of a, a year that goes backwards if you don't have something to pull you beyond that year. So if you want something to pull you through all kinds of challenges, all kinds of difficulties, and things that come at you, you got to have something on out there beyond today, beyond next week, beyond next month, beyond this year that pulls you into the future. And the clearer it is, the stronger it pulls. The more, the more dynamic it is, the more it affects your life, your spirit, your heart, your soul. It also creates imagination. It gets your mind working on how to achieve that purpose. And if your mind will work, and if your heart works, and if your spirit works, and if you have good input, like good ideas, I'm telling you, there isn't anything you can't accomplish. So that's one of the great powers that'll make a variable of you, and that is purpose. Here's one more, and that is the power of extraordinary performance and demanding of yourself excellent results. This is so important. If you want to live extraordinary, you must do extraordinary. If you want an extraordinary income, you must do extraordinary things. If you want an extraordinary fortune, you must go with the demands of what it takes to have that fortune. You have to demand it of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you jog around the block every morning, but if you want good health, you must demand it of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you read a couple of books a week and improve your intelligence and your knowledge. That you must demand of yourself. Society does not demand that you build a financial wall around your family nothing can get through. That's not a demand of society. But you must demand it, if you wish it, you must demand it of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you learn a list of ten skills in order to ensure your own future and the future of your family. Society doesn't demand it, doesn't require it. It is not a law. But if you want the benefit, you must demand it of yourself. I'm asking you to dedicate yourself to a new level of learning. You know, study, learn, grow, change, develop. Never let it be said you didn't learn, right? If you want to solve your problems, you got to learn. If you want to take advantage of an opportunity, you got to learn. We can't come here and just give you the marketing plan, give you the product, send you home. We got to stay for a while. Learn, stay for a while, right? Put on those cassettes and stay for a while, right? We asked you to come here for a couple of days and... Stay for a while, do some learning, take it back home. Don't miss the opportunity to learn. Take a good key phrase home, use it in your training. Don't be lazy in learning. Don't be casual in learning. If you've had a bad week, just sit down and ponder that for a while. Study it. See if you can't pick up some ideas from a poor week and then make a better week. Learn from your own experience. Call didn't go well, all the stuff. Guess what they did when they finished that call? They made... Another call. What else could we do to make it better? How could we possibly improve? This is called the possibility for life change starts with education. Don't be lazy in learning. Don't be lazy in picking up the ideas. Don't be lazy in learning from your own experience. That's why you've heard from some people that have shared their testimonial here and given you some of their ideas, ways, and means of taking this product to the marketplace, making it work for you. We've devoted most of our time for that, and well, we should. Learning is the beginning of wealth. Learning is the beginning of life change. You have the ability to develop these disciplines that create value in your life. The disciplines learning how to sell, learning how to get customers, learning how to build that customer base, uh, the, the skills of learning how to recruit, 
You can learn to do that. You have the power to do that. Uh, learning how to serve your organization well. Learning how to communicate. Uh, learning how to organize the people that you put together. Uh, learning how to keep in touch. All of that is within your personal power. And just think about it a little more now than you have maybe in the past. There's no reason why you can't have all of the business you want, all of the success you want. There's no reason why you cannot dramatically, this year especially, affect your own life. And by that, affect the lives of the people that you want to touch in the years to come. Each person's income is determined primarily by their philosophy, not by the economy. Once I understood that, then I said, well, I don't have to go to work on the economy. And the answer was no. You only have to go to work on yourself to make yourself more valuable. So now here's things I want to share with you. And the first one is your personal philosophy. What can get you more prepared and ready for cashing in on the opportunity of the 21st century? And here's the first one, personal philosophy. Your personal philosophy is like a guidance system that helps you make decisions what to do, what not to do. From the information you get and what you learn and what you know, we decide. Maybe your philosophy would have been uh, five years ago never to attend seminars like this. You just didn't go. Now, five years later, here you are. Something happened along the way to change your mindset saying, hey, for the money and the time, if I just get one good idea and walk away, it certainly is worth the money and the time. So now that little amendment in your philosophy, you now say, I'm going to regularly go because it doesn't take but a few ideas to make a great difference in your income, personal life, social life, and all the rest. So now you know that's valuable. A change of mind, a change of idea. So that's what personal philosophy is all about. The more we learn, the more we know, the better we're able to make better decisions about two major things. Your philosophical guidance system does two things. For your notes, number one, helps you to see the dangers on one side. So you can avoid those. But here's what else your guidance system does. Personal philosophy helps you to see the opportunities on the other side so that you can expand those, maximize those. And here's what that's called. The game of life is to minimize the dangers and maximize the opportunities. And the more we know and the more we learn, the more experience we gather in sessions like this, from the sermon on Sunday morning to the books we read and all the rest, helps us to keep continually adjusting our philosophical guidance system so that we minimize more dangers, maximize more opportunities. That's really the game of life. I couldn't put it much more simply. We're affected by what we know. Now, how do we know more things and learn more things that'll help us readjust our thinking so we can avoid the dangers, maximize the opportunities? Here's number one, learn from personal experience. One way to learn to, to do something right is what? First do it wrong, right? Mess up. And then you say, wow, that was costly. I'm never going to do that again. So one way to learn to do it right, first do it wrong. Sometimes a negative experience turns out finally to be positive. Here's what my mentor said that some of the best advice I ever got. He said, Mr. Roney, if you will change, everything will change for you. If you'll start making personal changes, your income will change, your health will change, your future will change, everything will change if you're willing to start making the change. So sometimes a negative experience now causes us to really make a sudden shift in our philosophical guidance system that says, hey, I'm never gonna let this happen to me again. Now here's the next way to learn, and that is to learn from other people's experiences, whether they are negative or positive. It's too bad failures don't give seminars like this. Wouldn't that be good information? Now we don't wanna pay them so they don't lecture, so. But their information would be valuable. If you know a guy that's messed up his life for 40 years, you have to say, John, would you spend a day with me? And I will bring my notebook and take good notes. A good looking guy like you, beautiful family, every reason to do well, threw it all away. Teach me how for the last 40 years you messed it all up. And he tells you, and you take good notes learning from the negative side of someone's experience. So 
Learn number one from your own experiences. Learn number two from other people's experiences. If you want to live a dynamic life, multiplying your income, multiplying your future, be a good student. If a good idea comes your way, write it down. Then ponder it. Then perhaps go do it. Okay. Now, your philosophy comes from what you learn, comes from what you know, comes from other people's experiences. Three ways now to learn from other people. Here's number one, learn from what you see. One of the great watchwords of these early years of the 21st century, pay attention. If you just watch, you can pick up clues. Success leaves clues. And if you'll be a better observer of the winners and the losers, those that are doing well and those that are falling behind, and just take mental notes and good notes and say, I'm going to adjust to what I'm doing based on what I see. Here's number two. We learn so much from other people based on what we hear. Here's good advice on that. Be a selective listener. Listen to voices of value that have experience, ideas, reputation, something valuable to share. Now here's number three. Read all the books. Now there's millions of books, so you can't read all the books. But make this note. Read all the books you need to read to make you as wealthy as you want to be, as healthy as you want to be, as prosperous, as productive, as unique a human being as you want to be, to be. Read all of those books. Don't leave those books go unread. Mr. Shelf got me started on my library. I've got one of the better libraries. Haven't read everything in it, but I feel smarter just walking in it, my library. At least I was smart enough to buy it. Now I got to be smart enough to read it. Then, of course, I got to be smart enough to decide what's valuable and then do it. But this one is very important. Become a good reader. Some books that helped change my life. Mr. Shelf recommended, of course, the Bible. And my parents made sure I was a pretty good scholar by the time I was 18. That's been so beneficial for me, drawing from those illustrations, uh, reading about those stories, people who made it and people who didn't make it, and what the difference was. And then other books that helped to really change my life. One called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And then a book that helped me become financially independent by the time I was 31. And that book is called The Richest Man in Babylon. But I started reading the books, attending the classes, making sure that I got in front of people that had something good to say. And then I started keeping a journal. One of the major things my teacher taught me was to keep a journal. He said, don't trust your memory. If you hear something good, just make a little note and write it down. Now, at first, I took, you know, notes on pieces of paper and torn off corners and backs of old envelopes, and it didn't serve me well, you know, thrown in a drawer. Then I learned to keep a journal, a bound copy of all my notes. So I would suggest you do the same. Things that impress you, a poem that impresses you. Uh, when you attend a class, some of the ideas that impressed you, jot them down. Uh, you read something in a magazine, right? Some ideas. Take those out, put them in your journal. Keep a good journal the rest of your life. This will serve you well. My journals make up a significant portion of my own library. And if you saw my library and saw my journals, I'd tell you what you'd have to say. This is the library, and these are the journals of a very serious student. No wonder Mr. Rohn is invited to lecture and speak on his experiences around the world. So I want the same thing to happen to you. Value captured that you can resort to later, go back over it and review it, and let it become valuable to you. Work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Develop the skill. Learn the lessons. Take the classes. Uh, absorb all that is being taught to you these days. And then later on, of course, you can sort it out, what's valuable to you and how to refine it for your business and for your life and for your future. But the main thing is to get it and start this process of personal change personal development. And let me say it one more time. If you will change, everything will change for you. You'll never be the same. You'll keep growing. As you look back on a few months, look back on a few years, you won't believe the progress you can make economically, your relationship with your family, your friends, and whether you're in sports or economics or whatever, I'm telling you that whole process of committing yourself for personal change, personal value, can really make your life unique and worthwhile. Now, jot this down. When you do read, you have to sort through what you read and decide which is valuable to try. That's part of the process of learning. 
gathering information and sorting through it. One, the information that would apply to you and what you think would be valuable based on your current philosophical opinion. So read all the books. Our lives are greatly affected by what we learn and what we know. Then here's another one. You have the ability and the power to decide. Decision-making can be the beginning of a new growth period for you, not only personally, but a growth period for your business, your skill levels, your ability to reach out and touch other people, the ability to decide. What a long list of personal power you have, that I have, that all of us have. We just need to be reminded. Now here's another one, and that's the ability to act, the ability to put into action what you see, what you comprehend, what you imagine, what you believe, and then what you have faith for. That ability to act is unprecedented in creating the miracle because it's not imagination that creates a career. It's not imagination that creates a business. It's not imagination that creates a customer base. It's using your imagination and finally putting it to work. But you have the ability to do that. If you have to get started with limited time, you just make the limited time pay. You know, before you go to work, during your lunch hour, in the evenings, on the weekends, little pieces of time that you find something to do that will start your career, keep it going, and keep the momentum high. Your ability to, to act can develop all of the discipline because you cannot learn the disciplines unless you actually do the work, unless you actually do the action. It's like learning to communicate. Way back in those early days, I had a tough time. You know, I described it one time, my first meeting, I stood up, my mind sat back down, left me standing there. I opened my mouth and nothing came out. My knees are banging together. The sweat's pouring off my face. I'm scared. It's called terror, right? Those first few times. But sure enough, I did it again. I worked up the courage to do it the third time and the fourth time. And that was about 35, 36 years ago. I'm glad you were not in on my first presentation. And now much more confidence all these years later because I have acted on practicing my skills to communicate. But you've got the ability to do that. You've got the power and the ability to create a career, a career that will serve you well for whatever li uh, time you want to spend in developing this career. You have the ability to develop an enterprise, a business, to be in business for yourself. Learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Learning is the beginning of life change. Learning is the beginning of wealth, value you become. This can make you a living. This can make you a fortune. I learned that little economic outline when I was 25 years old. It really changed my life. Now, here's something that changed my life forever. When I found out at age 25 that my income was primarily determined by my philosophy, not the economy. So make that note now. If you, if you know it, that's wonderful. If you teach it, that's even better. Your income is primarily determined by your philosophy, not the economy. I had no concept of that when I was 25 years old. I would have sworn to you. Because when my mentor said to me, how come you're not doing well? I showed him my paycheck. He said, look, this is all the company pays. He said, no, that's all the company pays you. I thought, well, that's a new way to look at it. Speaking of philosophy, how would you go from $5 an hour to $6 an hour? Let me give you some examples on philosophy that can get you from $5 an hour to $6 an hour. Here's number one. Wait for the government to change the minimum wage. That's simple and easy, right? If you wait long enough, sure enough, the government will change the minimum wage, let's say, to $6. Now, by law, the company must pay you $6, so you're home free. You say, yes, but how long will it take? Answer, I'm sure much longer than you want to wait. But that's the first philosophy, wait for the government. Here's number two, wait for the company to pay you $6. How long will that take? How often is the review? Six months, one year, let's say you don't make it. Second year, say, well, that's a long time to go from five to six. It is a long time, but that's the next philosophy, wait for the company. Here's the third philosophy, and that's to go on strike. 
We call it the philosophy of demand. I demand $6 or I won't work. Now, if you're by yourself, this is a risky philosophy. If you've got a thousand people now to take with you to the company and say, all thousand of us will not work unless we get $6, now you might have a chance. But by yourself, this philosophy doesn't work very well. The philosophy of demand only works by collective bargaining, we call it. And it does work. However, it's very limiting. You might get an extra penny or two. You might get an extra dollar. You might get an extra benefit. But it's very limiting, the philosophy of demand. And here's what for sure. Jot this down. Using the philosophy of demand, you cannot get rich. If getting rich is of interest to you. You can't get rich using this philosophy. Gosh, it's so sad when somebody is in the right country and they got the wrong philosophy. So you can't get rich by demand. So now, what would be the next philosophy that might work better for all of us? And I'm sure it's one of the reasons why all of us got here to this room today. Here it is, the philosophy of performance. The philosophy of performance simply states, I will perform so well, arriving early, staying late, doing all the extra things, that the company would easily be justified in paying me $6. My father gave one of the greatest seminars in a simple little sentence. Here's what Papa said. I wish he was here to say it. Always do more than you get paid for to make an investment in your future. These are philosophies. Follow. Your income is determined primarily by your philosophy. See, that changes everything. Now, jot this down. To climb this ladder as high as you wish. And you got to underline the word wish. Because part of your future now is what you wish and what you want. To climb this ladder as high as you wish in terms of bringing value to the marketplace and becoming valuable to the marketplace as high as you wish, here's all you have to do and learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Some of the things Mr. Shove taught me starting at age 25, some things came quickly, some things came easily, setting goals, that was easy. But this one I had to struggle with, personal development. It was hard for me to give up my old blame list. It was so comfortable blaming the government and blaming my negative relatives and the company, company policy, unions, wage scale, economy, interest rates, prices and circumstances and all that. That was difficult for me to give up. It was quite a transition for me to make and blaming myself. But Mr. Shove started out with something very, very important. Let me give that to you. He said, it's not what happens that determines the major part of your future. It's not what happens. What happens happens to us all. He said, the key is what you do about it. It's not what happens. It's what you do about it. And he said, if you will start that process of change, do something different the next 90 days than you did the last 90 days, like picking up the books to read. Do something different like the new health disciplines, relationship with your family, whatever it is, doesn't matter how small it is. If you'll start doing different things with the same circumstances, since we cannot change the circumstances, but we can change ourselves, we can change what we do. And then he gave me another secret to success when he said, what you have at the moment, Mr. Rowan, you've attracted by the person you've become. What you have at the moment, you've attracted by the person you've become. A few little simple principles here. Once you understand these, it starts to explain so much. Now, sometimes it's a little tough to take blaming yourself instead of the marketplace. Taking responsibility instead of putting it off on someone else. Those, that transition sometimes is a challenging mission. And this one was a little tough for me. He said, Mr. Owen, you've got pennies in your pocket. You've got nothing in the bank. The creditors are calling. You're behind on your promises. And he says, here's how that occurs. You've attracted, up until now, you've attracted the things to you because of the person you've become. Now I said, well, how can I change all that? He said, very simple. If you will change, everything will change for you. You don't have to change what's outside. All you've got to change is what's inside. To have more, you simply have to become more. And then he said, don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. Don't wish for less problems. Wish for more skills. Start working on yourself, making these personal changes. He said, it'll all change for you. So let's talk a little bit about personal development. 
that extraordinary adventure I undertook starting at age 25. And I've never ceased that adventure. I'm still going for it in the 90s. I want to get better and better. I want my craft to get better, my business operations to get better, the things I do to get better. Because once I picked up this simple formula, I'm telling you it's easy to figure out where the problem is if you go to work on it. Now, let's talk about personal development. And in helping kids understand personal development, I always start with money. Now, money's not the only place to start. Money certainly isn't the only value, but we've all got to start somewhere. Money's something you can count, right? Kids are interested in money, okay? A lot of things are a little tougher to measure, but economics is pretty easy, right? Because you can count, okay? Somebody says, how are you doing? You say, I don't know. Let's count. Now, this is not the only count. I understand that. There's a lot of other things to count. But to see if there may be some errors in your judgment and lack of disciplines in your life, we might as well start with money because it's so easy to count. So let's just start there and see whether or not maybe we have messed up. We get paid for bringing value to the marketplace. Key to understanding economics. We get paid for bringing value to the marketplace. Marketplace is also described as reality. Reality, the marketplace. Now, it takes time. It takes time to bring value to the marketplace, but we don't get paid for time. Very important for kids to understand, as well as adults. We don't get paid for time. Mistakenly, the man says, well, I'm making about $20 for an hour. Not true. Not true. If that was true, you could just stay home, have them send your money. No, it's not true. You don't get paid for the hour. You get paid for the value you put in the time. So we don't get paid for time. We get paid for value. Now, since that's true, here's one of the key questions of the afternoon. Is it possible to become twice as valuable and make twice as much money in the same time? Is it possible to become three times as valuable as you now are and make three times as much money in the same time? Is that possible? Of course. If you want to really emphasize something, that's a good phrase to it. Of course. Of course. Now, all you have to do to earn more money in the same time is simply become more valuable. But that's kind of a pitiful way to live. Start and not grow. Start and not change. Start and not become more valuable. Hey, the whole scenario of life is to start, number one, and what? Become more valuable, number two. So America's a ladder to climb. Starts at $4 an hour, and the more valuable you become, you just keep moving up the ladder. Top income last year, what, $52 million? Guy that runs Disney? Would a company pay somebody for one year's work $52 million? And the answer is... Of course, this is one of those of course places. Of course. If you help a company make a billion dollars, would they pay you 52 million? The answer is, of course, it's chicken feed. I mean, it's not much money. Now, why that much money? Because he has become so valuable. Now, why would we pay somebody only $4 an hour? They're not very valuable to the marketplace. Now, we've got to make that distinction to the marketplace. Might be a valuable brother, a valuable member of the community, valuable member of the church, valuable member in the sight of God, to the human family, of course, those kind of values. But to the marketplace, which is called what? Reality. Reality is, if you're not very valuable, you don't get much money. Those are called the facts. Well, then how do you get more money? Simple answer. Somebody says, well, I'll go on strike for more. Here's a major problem with that. You can't get rich by demand. Somebody says, well, I'm waiting for a raise. I'm telling you, it's easier to climb than to wait for a raise. Why not just become more valuable rather than wait? I'm telling you, that's the key to all good things. Becoming more valuable.